Oh, uh, everyone, I, I love y'all very much. It's good to be here. Uh, I love New York City. I love living here. I uh, recently, this summer, celebrated my eight-year anniversary of living here in New York City. Thank you. You know, uh, I don't know if you can tell. Uh, I'm from a small town in Colorado. When I first moved to New York City, the big bad city, as a little bit of a wimp. <laughs> if you can believe it, all those years ago. Um, but you know what they say, the old saying, uh, if you put a cucumber in the brine jar, you're gonna kill its soul. <laughs> in that metaphor, I'm the cucumber. Uh, New York City is the, the brine jar, and my, my dead soul, it's been bludgeoned. Uh, by the city over the last eight years, my hopes and dreams and all my beliefs. So that's uh, that's that. Uh, maybe I've toughened up a little bit. I'm not sure. I'll let you be the judge. Uh, by way of illustration, with a little anecdote, uh, this summer I was riding my bike, and a truck driver came very close to me, aggressively close. He was trying to send a message, and he shouted out his window as he passed me on my bike, "Hey, buddy, get out of the road!" And so I'm, I'm not proud of this, but in the moment, without, without thinking, I just reacted. And I, and I tried to say the meanest thing I could think of, which was, I have just as much of a right to be here as you do, <laughs> sir. <laughs> and that's what, that's what eight years of soul crushing will do to you. You become a monster. like. <laughs> And I apologize that I had to repeat that for all of you to hear. Uh, so New York City has been beating me from the very start. Well, when I first moved to New York City, my first job, I was a middle school teacher. I was doing a program called Teach for America. And uh, believe it or not, those, those middle school students, they could tell that I was a pushover. I don't know how, they sensed it. But the very first day of class, I got up in front of my seventh graders. I was ready to deliver my English language arts lesson. And as I was speaking, uh, a young student named James raised his hand and he said, hey, Mr. Dern, dance. <laughs> and so I said, James, thank you for raising your hand. <laughs> and I knew I had a choice to make. And I thought about it. And I knew that I shouldn't dance. But the same part of me that gets up here to do stand-up comedy thought that maybe if I dance funny enough, I could win their respect. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be Nate Dern, the dancing middle school teacher, who danced so funny that everyone wanted to learn about words. <laughs> That's how I danced. And I could see any respect that they might have had for me <laughs> just drain from their faces. Like, even James was disappointed that it worked. You could see he was like, oh man, guess we're not learning again this year. <laughs> that achievement gap staying wide open. And so, it was a surprise to me when I learned that uh, my students had given me the nickname Mr. Jerk. So I'm not strict at all. Why are they calling me Mr. Jerk? So a few weeks in, I asked one of the other teachers in the teacher's lounge, hey, why are the students calling me Mr. Jerk? And she was like, oh, don't worry about it. It's short for jerk off. <laughs> <laughs> like, that would make me feel better. I was like, well, why, why are they calling me Mr. Jerk? And then she explained, it was because, unbeknownst to me, I had the nervous habit that when I was up at the board writing with my chalk, I would hold the chalk in my hand, and as I was addressing the students, I would juggle the chalk in my hand like this. So I'd be like, James, why are you listening to James? James, respect me! I have just as much of the right to be here as you do, James! I didn't last very long as a middle school teacher. <laughs> I did my best. <laughs> New York City still scares me all these years later. Uh, I try not to judge people though right away. Um, like I was on the, the subway earlier, and it was very crowded, and we came to a stop and a large woman 
pushed her way on and she stepped on the foot of the smaller woman. And the smaller woman turned and said, bitch. And I judged her. I thought to myself, oh, that woman is rude. But then she immediately followed that by saying, please. And I realized, oh, that woman is polite. So it just goes to show, you can't judge people until you hear the second half of their sentence. Sometimes, though, it's tough. Sometimes the second half of a sentence is implied. You have to figure it out from context. It's unspoken. I'll give you an example. Uh, I've been trying to be a little bit healthier. I've been uh, taking the stairs rather than the elevator at work. And so I took the five flights of stairs up to my fifth floor office, and I walked in. And a coworker said, hey, Nate, have you been working out? And normally, that's a compliment. But then I realized the, second half, the implied second half of that sentence was not, hey, Nate, have you been working out, dot, 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 generally. She meant, hey, Nate, have you been working out, dot, 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 just now. <laughs> because you're out of breath and your face is red. And you're sweating a whole lot. Uh, in my pursuit of trying to be healthier, I, I have been doing yoga lately. That's actually not quite accurate. Um, I have done yoga within the last year. I still misspoke. Um, I ate a meatball sandwich today. That's what I meant to say. I got it wrong the first time. Wildly wrong. Uh, I think if I exercised more, I would sleep better. I'm a bad sleeper. Uh, I'm very sensitive to light, so I wear a sleep mask. And I'm very sensitive to sound, so I put in earplugs. And I'm very sensitive to having objects attached to my face and stuffed in my ear canals, so I don't sleep. <laughs> When it's time for me to sleep, my brain doesn't listen. I feel like at bedtime, I have the relationship with my brain that a spineless father has with his bratty teenage daughter. I'll be like, brain, you got stuff to do in the morning, go to bed. And my brain will be like, shut up, I hate you. <laughs> I don't wanna go to bed, I'm looking at Instagram. <laughs> I do like Instagram a lot. It's my favorite of the social mediums. Uh, I, uh, I especially like my favorite Instagram account is Humans of New York. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, it uh, it's a, a, an account that posts uh, portraits of just everyday New Yorkers, uh, often accompanied with a poignant question and answer from an interview, sometimes about uh, some pretty uh, deep topics. Um, and I really think that it has made me love humanity, love my fellow New Yorkers a little bit more. But the, uh, the downside is that it's made me like all of my friends a little bit less. <laughs> because when you see a friend's photo of a 3 a.m. brunch cocktail on a Sunday that says, sassy brunch, you're like, hey, that's a little self-involved. But when you see that photo next to a photo, of a 43-year-old Haitian immigrant who at the age of 18 dropped out of school, giving up his dream of becoming a doctor because he had a son that he needed to take care of, so he became an assistant to a carpenter, putting his own dreams aside and giving everything to his child. And today, the day that this photograph was taken is the best day of his life because his son, all these years later, just graduated from med school. The cocktail photo next to that, all of a sudden, you don't just look self-involved, you look like a monster. <laughs> and for a few moments, I'll really give myself pause and think, wow, there's these beautiful souls in New York City and I've chosen to surround myself with these vapid, superficial people. And I'll have that thought for as long as it takes me to open up the camera app on my phone and take a photo of my brunch cocktail <laughs> and post it to Instagram. Hashtag eight years in New York, bitches! Thank you, I'm Nate Dern, that's my guy. <laughs>